hello everyone. My name is Amy Gantman and I'm the Executive Director of the Brentwood Arts Center. I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversations on Art with Meg Linton and guest artist, Lori Hogan. It has been a challenging time for the world and for BAC as we transitioned our offerings to a virtual format which has allowed the BAC to continue to fulfill its mission of providing high quality arts educational opportunities to students of all ages. Our success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through Thick and through Thin. The pandemic has also allowed us to experiment with new technology and to create programs such as Conversations on Art. And I would like to thank our anonymous donor who has made this series possible for the next 12 months. We can only do all that we do because of generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and to education. Our host, Meg Linton, and I met at Otis College of Art and Design while she was the director of exhibitions and I was the Dean of Continuing Education. We collaborated on many public programs and I am thrilled that we are able to bring her love and respect for the artist to BAC. She has been visiting artist studios for well over 20 years in her various roles as director and curator of contemporary art spaces in the Central and Southern California region. Currently, Meg is working on an exhibition about the life and work of artist Keith Julius Puccinelli. She's writing a novel and of course, conversing with Lori Hogan for the BAC this afternoon. I'd like to welcome Meg Linton. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, welcome to Conversations on Art, hosted by the Brentwood Art Center. Uh, we appreciate all of you taking a break with us from your busy day to enjoy a little art and beauty this afternoon. I'm grateful for our ability to do so with the turmoil happening in the world right now. Thank you to the BAC team and our anonymous donor who is making this program series possible. Before I introduce our guest, I want to let you know we are recording this program. And if, if you could all make sure your video um, is off and your, and your voice is muted, um, that would help with the recording. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and I will either work the questions into the conversation or save them till the end. I'm thrilled to have Lori Hogan virtually bring us into her studio today. In her artist statement, Lori writes, that her work from the past 20 years consists primarily of allegorical paintings of mutant plants and animals in languishing overgrown landscape settings or posed as though for classical still life or portraiture. Don't let these lavish and enti enticing paintings fool you because her subjects do bite. Critic Susan Snodgrass suggests that Hogan employs a bait and switch tactic, luring viewers with virtuoso technique and then inserting submersive, often harsh cultural criticism conveyed through her fantastic anthropomorphized creatures, pointed allegories, and ironic text and decorative artifice. Through these paintings, the artist touches on predatory drives, evolutionary biology, global marketing and consumerism, and much, much more. Lori, welcome, and thank you for bringing us into your studio. We're first going to get a little tour of Lori's studio before we begin our conversation. Thank you. And so the way this studio tour um, <clears throat> can work is um, I mute myself on the, in the Zoom room on the, la on the uh, desktop, and then I open it up on the phone, and then I use a mirror to see what I'm showing you. So. Um, it, it might make for a slightly weird ride, but that's what I'm gonna do. So um, I'll start this way. All right. Now, can we see the, uh, there we go. All right, this is my studio. It's where I was sitting a minute ago. 
and let's there we go yeah all right all right so this this part of the studio is um you know is the painting part of the studio you can see there are a few works in progress uh large work in progress over here uh in front of the mechanicals door um got one of one of my one of my uh studio assistants right here there's another one somewhere else in the house that one's called xena um more works in progress over here. Um, it's a mobile table for larger works. Um, this is uh, where I work on uh, drawings and works on paper, uh, collages, gouache paintings. There's Reggie's bed. Reggie and Zena are the two studio dogs. Um, some more works on progress. Works in progress up here. Um, I suppose this, this shows you a bit of um, my process. I use um, a, a fairly conventional or traditional uh, process for making oil paintings, where I, uh, I use traditional oil painting media, um, uh, and I start with um, a, a layer uh, or value, value sketch as the first layer, and then I gradually build up layers of color. Uh, to describe space and form and volume and uh, usually work directly on the canvas without too many preliminary sketches. So through here, this is my wood shop and this is where I make frames. Uh, my flammable liquids cabinet, fascinating. Bag of garbage, also just a great thing to have in the studio. Uh, this is a work table um, where I, I make frames, stretch canvases, that sort of thing, make panels. Slow, slow down, Lori. Uh, sorry? Slow the, slow the movement of the camera down a little bit. All right. <laughs> it's getting a little. There we go. And when did you start making all your own custom frames? Uh, probably about 30 years ago. And I can talk about this a little more. Yep. Um, you know, most, most people can, uh, walk, chew gum and talk at the same time, but, um, <laughs> also with the, trying to navigate with a, uh, mirror, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little cognitive overload here. Um, but the frames are really important. These are some frames in progress. Um, these are these, these corners that I make, um, there's a process for that too. These are some molds, uh, silicone rubber molds. Nice. That I use to make those. Uh, but frames are a really important part of the work. Uh, framing as a practice, as a cultural practice, um, you know, we, we use the word frame to describe structures that we set up in order to uh, delimit or define ways of thinking about the world. We frame ideas, we frame laws, the, the, they were the, 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 the uh, authors of the founding fathers were framers of the constitution. Um, so the notion of framing, um, the, 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 the feminist theorist Elizabeth Gross wrote about what she called the originary, originary I think she made up that word, architectural gesture where um, the frame, you know, the quadrangle that describes the picture, that describes, uh, you know, now the, the cell phone, the, the, uh, the box that, through, through which we view the world, um, this notion of the quadrangle framing things is... Uh, um, sort of essential to understanding just the, the fact of making sense of the world. You know, the idea that, that uh, it's sort of a structuralist idea, the, the idea that language, that frames are, are, are sort of a, a, a part of the language that makes us understand something as a picture. So, yeah. so that's the studio. Thank Hi, you. Zina. I just <laughs> wanted to also point out to everybody that there is a retired hockey uniform in the background too. Yes. 
I, uh, I played ice hockey. I had actually a great, this is, this is a sort of a parody of a hockey uniform. <laughs> um, this is a, um, uh, an invented, uh, um, an invented character. Uh, and as you can see her, <laughs> nice. <laughs> her team is a, is a mad bunny. Um, and uh, this was actually shown at, at uh, Copland Del Rio Gallery in Los Angeles a few years ago, maybe 2010, I believe, wow. um, as, a, as a you know series of sort of costume works, which sort of went along with the idea, with the paintings. So the idea that the paintings are stories and that these are narratives or characters in narratives. So um, should I stop sharing the studio yeah, now? Let's, let's jump to the presentation. So we'll All right, get a great. second to do that. Sounds good. And I'll, I'll bring up the PowerPoint. Cool. So while, while Lori's rejoining us, I just wanted to also announce that Lori's got a show on at uh, Copland Del Rio Gallery in Seattle. So I've included the link to that show um, in the chat box. But we'll also be talking about some of the artwork in that show um, in a few moments. All right, well, here she is. I'm, I'm I'm back, and actually, it's it's really it, it's really strange. It's like you know, sort of um, navigating, like holding the phone like this, and then the mirror, and looking in the mirror, and it's like yeah. really one of those things where. Um, so if I was halting in my speech, I <laughs> I apologize a little. You actually, little, did really well. <laughs> A little more Mountain Dew will set me just right. Yep. <laughs> I'm sure I would have tripped or fallen on something. Um, yeah, so this is your show, but let's, um, do you want to talk about the title of the show for a second? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. So the word haze, and there's a reason that it's all in caps because uh, it's 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 not just um, a sort of one understanding of the the word haze, but it's multiple ones. So um, the title haze, it's a word that can it can refer to um, air pollution from um, from industry or wildfires. It it can refer to um, a mental state, right, um, of ignorant or or confused transcendence. You're in a haze. Um, hazing someone, it can be an act of harassment or gaslighting. Um, so these multiple meanings um, uh, of the word, I, I, I was like puns, you know, and multiple meanings, because it's already also about how slippery language is, you know, that, that one word can mean a whole bunch of different things, and sometimes even contradictory things, you know, sort of suggests that, that even though language frames our experience, those frames are not necessarily entirely dependable. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thought too. So the sort of slippage of the word haze, um, uh, it also is about the, the show's main topics, right? You know, there's like um, uh, the sort of pol uh, political um, uh, cartoons uh, or the uh, signs, symbols, allegories, icons, uh, metaphors that are in the show um, also refer to um, those ideas of hazing, you know, like literal environmental destruction, but also the sort of political hazing that we're <laughs> living through right now. Yeah, um, constant. Yeah, and yeah. also the idea that 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 that, um, that the culture th throws so much at us in terms of stuff that is that is both distressing and pleasurable that we have no choice but to be in confused transcendence, you know, part of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, those are those are some of the the reasons for that 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 title. That's great. So let's dive in because we have a lot of images to look at, which is wonderful. So this one is called Arctic Heat. And um, it's, it's subtitled Habitat Diorama with Promethean Species. Um, and the Promethean species in this case is um, um, a reference to um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, it was the subtitle uh, and her reference to the myth of Prometheus in, in her 1818 novel, Frankenstein or a modern Prometheus, uh, which like the myth described the horrifying consequences of, of human arrogance and, and hubris in, in um, uh, you know, so the book was the irrationally egotistical manipulation um, and domination of the natural world. 
um, which um, I also think about, you know, Gene Wilder and Young Frankenstein, <laughs> where he's like, I have the key to life itself, and sort of that parody of that hubris, um, which was what was so brilliant about that movie. Um, but it describes the horrifying consequences of that, um, that domination of the natural, or that attempt to dominate the natural world. Um, and those impulses often cause the, the worst human instincts, greed, um, grandiosity. Um, they can also be described as being inspired by some of the best human instincts, curiosity, a spirit of discovery, quest for knowledge, those things. Um, so the idea of Mary Shelley's Prometheus, you know, stealing fire from the gods is both hubris and, you know, has disastrous co co uh, consequences as well as um, um, important um, uh, results for humanity. Um, and so you can see in this image, like these creatures are all bleached, <laughs> um, you know, made albino, uh, which is, um, you know, it's a mutation that is often used uh, for lab animals. Um, and in this case, the, the creatures themselves are also sort of if they're, you know, Arctic species are often, um, are often uh, white furred or white skinned. But in this case, you know, there would never be rep reptiles in the Arctic. Right, because you know they, uh, especially in a snowy environment, they wouldn't survive. They're you know cold-blooded. So this is a, a situation where the animals are not only uh, mutated as though for laboratory experiments, you know, um, uh, white with with pink eyes, without pigment, um, uh, but they're also not quite exact recognizable species. Um, hi, Elena. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, so it, it ends up being an allegory um, about that sort of Promethean problem, that Promethean um, conundrum. Um, you can't see it in this image, um, but there's text written on the skull, that vaguely greenish skull. It's vaguely greenish as a sort of a, a feminage uh, to Mary Shelley's monster. Um, and it's a quote from a book, because uh, the, the book, is told in epistolary form. Um, Robert Walton is a polar explorer mm -hmm. uh, who meets Victor Frankenstein in the Arctic. Um, and it is to it, Walton that Victor tells his story and Walton in turn writes the story down um, uh, in a series of letters to his sister uh, back in England. And the text, the quote on the skull specifically is, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to reach which at present is so many months a requisite, are requisite, or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet, which, if at all possible, can only be affected by an undertaking such as mine. So again, the sort of grandiosity and hubris of the inventor of discovery, um, but there's a, you know, there's a subsequent disaster uh, for Prometheus, for Frankenstein's monster, for Frankenstein, uh, for Oppenheimer, um, for our treatment, for, you know, even our, uh, you know, I think about um, uh, good things, you know, important things gone bad. I think about the, how the green revolution, uh, you know, that invented uh, genetically modified crops and, and uniculture in order to feed billions of people who would have otherwise starved to death have led to industrial farming practices which are contributing to climate change. So the idea that there's this sort of rhizomatic um, sense of how things operate in the world, how everything is interconnected, um, uh, that's, that's kind of a big part of the idea uh, mm -hmm. behind this painting, the interconnectedness and the this sort of um, uh, harsh, horror story cartoon uh, of the results of failing to recognize that interconnectedness. Um, the, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, Lori, so you've kind of got in the background, you kind of have, it looks like burning skies. Yeah. 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 And then what are the little orange flags? Because it looks like they have writing on them as well. Yes, they do. They, um, those orange flags, I like those. Um, whenever you see those in the landscape, no matter where you are, you know it's because there are human beings doing something underground. <laughs> and that's like, it's such a, that's both, a, that's both literally true, um, but also a great metaphor is like there's technology underground or there's 
bureaucracy underground. There's human activity. We know it's there. We can see markers for it, but we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And the flags here, um, the text that's on the flags is both um, uh, resources that uh, can be extracted from the Arctic, you know, like bauxite and iron ore and um, uh, uranium and, of course, petroleum big time. There's, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, agitation to um, drill in the Arctic, of course. Um, so that's also why that the color of the liquid in the landscape um, looks like it might be crude oil or something. Um, so is those resources are, are written on those flags, uh, but also the names of um, uh, nuclear submarines uh, that are currently under Arctic ice um, from the three superpowers, Russia, uh, China, and the United States. Um, so like a Seawolf submarine, and then there's also, um, uh, I forget the, the names of the Russian submarines, but they translate into animal names as well, which is sort of interesting, orca or something like, or shark or something like that. Um, and then the Chinese uh, nuclear subs. So the idea that, that the Arctic is also this landscape, um, you know, ordinarily associated in the history of landscape painting with these, you know, massive you know, blue and white vistas, right? which is what this is, um, except for instead of, you know, instead of sort of the romance and, and, and uh, awe of icebergs as seen through the frame of 19th century explorerism, um, mine is seen through the frame of unintended consequences and mutation <laughs> and unseen activities uh, that result in these unintended consequences. Um, yeah. It's amazing. We're going to move on. <laughs> Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this, this one is called Habitat Diorama Late, Late Anthropocene Las Vegas Environs. And um, it's sort of a speculative fiction or speculative future um, uh, uh, piece that imagines as though the viewer we're looking at a museum habitat diorama from the future. And that this habit, this particular habitat diorama had creatures in it that were from the Las Vegas area. I mean, it's sort of a post-apocalyptic um, narrative. Um, um, you know, I think about like um, Margaret Atwood is, is, you know, like everybody's, everybody's favorite Canadian. <laughs> um, <laughs> And she talks about like in her, her um, Oryx and Crake trilogy, Year of the Flood. Um, if you haven't read that, that book or those books, um, they're fantastic. Uh, and um, uh, so she talks about how they are, they're not science fiction, they're speculative fiction. There's sort of this idea, or at the end of The Handmaid's Tale, she has a, a fake academic conference where people are looking back at the era of the, of the, um, of the original fiction. So that's the idea. It's like this painting sort of frames things again as, as though the viewer is looking back um, on the era of the original fiction, which is this sort of apocalyptic late Anthropocene era. Um, so then it says the effects of dopaminergic, dopaminergic, I can't pronounce my own words here, <laughs> Dopin, dopaminergic processes on the environment. And dopaminergic processes are processes in our brains that produce dopamine. So Las Vegas is a place that is built to produce dopamine. Gambling, the sex industry, bright lights. Um, I read an article about how um, there is a neuroscience of sound that that kind of the ringing of slot machines is, is um, activates parts of our brains that make us want more. So there, there is actually a neuroscience of, of accumulation in, in money and uh, sort of explains why we, we are attracted to some of the things we're attracted to as a species. So um, yeah, so this habitat okay. diorama, um, habitat dioramas are a recurrent theme and, and reference in my work. The way they frame, the way they set up nature as a, as a dramatic theatrical event. This one describes the, the speculative fictional landscape um, with the diorama um, 
drama played out among characters, including white tigers, which are a reference to Siegfried and Roy, uh, and flashy reptilians, uh, which are allegories for human pleasure seeking in impulses, um, are, which are clearly, they're, reptilians do that. They, they're always seeking pleasure, um, food, sunshine, um, and so are we, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're always seeking pleasure. Um, and that's rampantly evident in material culture. And um, to say that the material culture of Las Vegas in particular foregrounds these tendencies, that, that would be an understatement that the entire city is built on dopamine, basically. Um, so using Las Vegas as, a, as an extreme example of this universal phenomenon, this diorama suggests um, that the application of a natural history framing of an environment devastated by human activities attributable to um, these highly mediated types of pleasure, um, uh, energies and desires beyond those which might provide for a reasonable 21st century quality of life. Um, so, you know, uh, the philosopher George Bataille described the surplus energy in his book, The Accursed Share. Um, you know, the idea that we have this surplus energy and we, we seek to satisfy it. Um, uh, we seek to generate dopamine in our own brains. We, we, we look for activities to do that. Um, but so yeah, the, um, also because it's a diorama of the future, it indicates that we, sur somebody survived the apocalypse. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. It absolutely does. It, it, yeah. <laughs> it's very optimistic in that there way. There you go. <laughs> it's, it does, it certainly suggests that, that, that human beings did, uh, you know, which is another thing like, I, or at I least a single painter did. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and found paint somewhere. Yeah. Um, that, that was actually something I found very reassuring about the epilogue of, of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood is it is a, it's an academic conference that looks back on the era of the handmaid yeah. as, as a historical era. And it was mm -hmm. like, I actually appreciated that, you know, from, from the author is like, cause otherwise the, the yeah. hypothesis um, that was so believable in that book would have just been so discouraging. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my, uh, my comments on, on, um, on sort of post post catastrophe or post apocalypse uh, do have an optimism yeah yeah speaking of optimism bluebirds <laughs> the bluebird of happiness bluebirds of happiness yeah um this bluebird is is a mutant bluebird of happiness its happiness has been distorted by social media <laughs> so what are what's in the there's text written on the mushrooms and the and the flowers, and the flowers yeah yeah um, the text on the mushrooms and flowers are basically words associated with the unintended consequences of social media, um, riots and, and, um, uh, let's see, what are some of the other words? They're hard to read. Did I write them down somewhere? Probably. That's craze. Yeah. Yeah. Really, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the title, the title is allegor. Let's see. I'll just like consult some notes here. <laughs> yeah, Untitled Bluebirds, The Lamentation of the Bluebird One, and the other is uh, Untitled Bluebirds Two, The Mutation of the Bluebird. So one is lamenting and one is mutated. Um, so the diptych represents a, a hypothetical breeding pair illustration like you'd find in um, Audubon illustrations or field guides or something like that. Um, you know, and also like Dutch aviary painting, uh, naturalist illustrations. Um, or the so husband the, and wife paintings. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, there are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of breeding pairs in, in my work. And um, um, I think that has a lot to do with my interest in the systems of, of, of natural selection mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of the way that, you um, I mean, I'm sure there's also a way in which it also refers to sort of, you know, what they went in the academy, they called the uh, heteronormativity, the idea that there's this sort of idea about reproduction um, that was part of, that is part of natural science, you know? Right. Um, 
you know, that focus on it, but it's, so it's all those things and for better and for worse, it's like all those, all those things, but the breeding pair um, as a trope of natural history is, is, is very interesting to me. It's emphasis. It's very, it's sort of weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this, these, these bluebirds refer to the symbolic association of bluebirds with happiness, which oddly appears all over the world in European, Chinese, um, and first people's folklore, and also in popular culture. Um, they're also a, a subtle reference to Twitter's logo um, yeah. and Twitter's function in the culture. So the fruits and flowers and mushrooms um, sort of represent the proliferation of dangerous sentiments, which, um, you know, it's also, um, if you look up in Audubon or Field Guide, the bluebird's most common call is a low pitched to wheat with mm -hmm. a so-called querulous tone. So it's, um, that's uh, Cornell's lab of ornithology uh, um, describes it at that. So it's a uh, sort of a um, argumentative tweets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, you know, it's sort of the tragic and twisted nature of what happens on social media, right? You know, like when human beings get together, bad things can happen, you know? It's the worst of our species can rise to the top. Yeah. Um, I'm watching that uh, Netflix documentary, The Social, that's out uh -huh. right now, that's yeah. talking a lot about that uh -huh. and kind of changing the ethics and so forth. Yeah, and the, the, the sort of permission when we're not really connected to one another. Right. The permission to behave badly or be antisocial is is amplified by social media, not not reduced by it. Right. Um, my colleague Benjamin Grosser does does uh, um, uh, uh, digital based work uh, that address uh, uh, Facebook as as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty interesting work. So if you're interested in in in, in digital work um, uh, and those kinds of issues, definitely look him up. Um, so, so you have birds, you, birds are often in your paintings. Yes, they are. They're, they show uh, up all the time. Um, they're fascinating creatures. They're, you know, they're both dinosaurs, but they're also just gorgeous. They're also species in which sexual selection, um, is important, which basically is, you know, ladies choice, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Um, they also are very vulnerable to environmental poison. The nature of their nervous systems make them, make them, you know, so the canary in the coal mine, mm -hmm. um, their vulnerabilities. So, so, uh, things that show up in bird species first. Um, yeah. Uh, and also, um, I, feathers are, I just find feathers, um, what would be a, like enchanting is a silly word, but I, I just think they're stunning. I just, feathers are, are amazing as, a, as structures, as, as, you know, the just sublime visual things. Um, mm -hmm. The idea of a feather that, that this, that such things could have evolved is just stunning to me. Um, and it's fun to paint feathers. <laughs> Easy, meditative, Sometimes it gets a little old, but you know, I like painting feathers. Um, so how, how, how long from start to finish for a piece? It's really hard to tell because I spend approximately half my life waiting for things to dry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it also depends on how, how well the, the image goes. If I'm not satisfied with it, I, I have to scrape it down and paint over it and, and you know, sometimes really struggle with it. Uh, sometimes the best work comes out that way. Um, if I'm lucky and it just goes straight from the drawing to the finished work in and building up those layers um, and I don't have to, you know, change anything or alter anything and it, you know, and it just goes right. Um, I suppose a piece this size, which is probably about 36 by, uh, maybe it's by 48 by 30 inches or something like that, might take about of 80 to 120 hours cumulatively, yeah. something like that. So that's why when we saw in the studio, you had multiple 
pieces in process. Yes. So you're letting things dry. So you're moving from one to one. Yes. Good and enough. also because, um, you know, I'm, I teach and also I have an administrative job. Yeah. Um, and I also, um, you know, have, uh, family responsibilities. Um, uh, yeah. Um, you you're know, juggling a full schedule times when I have to, I have to leave. <laughs> I also Tell like us to... a little bit about the, the monkeys. Monkeys. Yeah. Monkeys show up monkeys show up in my work and have for a long time and um as characters they're like the history of monkeys in art um you know since medieval times they've um they've represented um you know sort of well in medieval times they were sort of you know the human being's sinful nature um but in the era of of contemporary cognitive neuroscience i think you know looking at brain structures and looking at similarities between primates and primate behavior primate brain structures uh including human primates um i, I think it's pretty clear that human beings are uh, behave like primates <laughs> mm -hmm. that that you know are and and to the extent that we have you know a neocortex which which simians don't um, you know, we can engage in, in a certain kind of um, rationally based uh, impulse control better than monkeys, at least we're supposed to. Right. And we don't always. And so uh, I have a, a series of works that's been going on since 2010 called Monkey Brains. And it's basically, you know, that's what you call a, a human being who's behaving badly, monkey brains. So um, in this show, this show included a, a portrait of a conspiracy theorist who was a, a, a monkey brained politician. Uh, and in this case, these are monkey brains, uh, three blue jingle monkeys beat on the skulls of patriots. Um, so it's an ongoing series, monkey brains, in which monkeys are used as stand ins for those aspects, often the worst, most socially destructive impulses of human behavior which are not tempered by reason, nor ethically justifiable, but are often seen as politically legitimate and socially appropriate because they telegraph and help perpetuate power structures like racism, gender oppression, mm -hmm. um, the excesses of consumerism. In this case, the color of the monkeys and the batons they wield are references to the excesses of, of law enforcement who are unable to control themselves, whether because they're excited uh, emotions or because they're fearful or because they're sadists uh, or because they're racists or because of gender bias or homophobia um, or other animus um, or other antisocial tendency, whatever the cause, um, they perpetrate abuses of power uh, up, up into up unto murder. Um, uh, and that, that, that threatens, you know, that lack of impulse control, that monkey brain. Mm -hmm. It threatens and betrays and ultimately destroys um, what I think are our most important American ideals. Um, you know, the ones I really believe in. <laughs> yeah. Liberty and justice for all. It's equal justice that's under the law. I know it, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but that's a deep creed for me. And getting there is a deep creed. So when monkey brains get in, this is a cartoon about monkey brains getting in the way of um, oh, Lori, we have a question. Are these all oil? Yes. Yes. Okay. They are all oil on panel with these artist made frames. Amazing. And so, and then also you have the character, the bunnies show up a lot as single portraits. Yeah. She's sort of an avatar for my own psyche. She's, she's sort of my, my spirit animal. It's just the mad sometimes, bunny. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes she, sometimes she's a he or, yeah. or, or they, you know, she's, she's definitely got a, 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 a um, um, she can, she can queer herself <laughs> usefully. Um, but yeah, that she's sort of an every woman, um, uh, sort of a, and she's sort of a stand in for a citizen. Um, in this case, the, this red, white, and blue one, this is sort of a, a, a petulant, um, infantile citizen, uh, who's pissed off that his cake candles went out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we know who this refers to, but <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And he's, he's, uh, um, yeah, this one, she's, she, yeah, he, he, this, this one is, is, uh, um, uh, just about how weird love is. Um, you know, so she's enjoying, um, her sense of agency. She's got predatory colors. Um, and she's in this still life. So she's got all these riches, 
of 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 um, emotional life, the weirdness of emotional life, um, sort of the full fruits of emotional life. That, that one of the that that weird orange like thing in the middle um, has love, the word love um, growing on its skin, um, and she's just sort of like acknowledging the weirdness of of intimate relationships, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> This is portrait of an angry patriot, and I, I sort of think that you know, sort of the the um, the iconic the, the iconography in this cartoon sort of um, um, somewhat self explanatory. The idea that that uh, that troop that, that that the real patriot who has reason to be angry um, uh, sports these colors, you know, it's these colors that don't run. <laughs> um, the uh, the text on the white fruits is uh, um, uh, Audre Lorde poems, uh, Langston Hughes poems, um, a, a passage from uh, the the uh, the anthem America the Beautiful, um, and and some other um, sort of important protest uh, uh, protest um, poetry and and songs. It's beautiful. Thanks. This is um got a quote from. Um, Virginia Woolf, and it says one cannot think, I think it's like, think well, rest well, love well, if one has not dined well. <laughs> and so the, the joke here is that it's really hard to dine well in contemporary food culture. <laughs> yes, when so much sugar creates the dopamine effect again. Exactly. And we okay. kind of are what we eat, you know, so that's, she doesn't, yeah. She's she's ha she's satisfied with. She's not going to share her cake. No, it's it's like definitely. Um, this one is just the, sort of about like the the sort of emptiness of um, um, the architect and social critic Adolf Luz wrote wrote about minimalism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of the uh, the the idea that that the aesthetic of um, ending ornament. And to me, that sort of suggested a, a, a kind of a, um, an aesthetic fascism, I guess, sort of a, um, something to mourn. Mm -hmm. um, My Pretty Ponies of the Apocalypse. <laughs> These are gorgeous. Thanks. So this, oh, this, these are plastic horses, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so in this case, I was thinking of um, um, the, I get my thoughts here. Um, each of these horses is named after a kind of plastic that um, won't go away, like ever. <laughs> like there's uh, there um, Hansalon style. Like this one, I think is I, I can't quite read it on the screen, but I think this one is polyethylene terephthalate. Mm -hmm. um, but there others are include like um, uh, polyvinyl chloride, diester of phthalic acid, polyethylene, butadiene styrene, acrylonitrile, bis bisphenol. Um, and so the series combines the, the history and tradition of horse portraiture, such as, such as you might see with like George Stubbs and lots of others in which animals were depicted for the prestige and pleasure they brought their owners. Um, you know, kind of the way cars do, certain kinds of cars do now. Um, along with the, you know, several other cultural touchstones too. So the title is a mashup um, of, uh, of three culturally resonant fables. My Little Pony, which is like Hasbro's toy line and the media franchise, um, which telegraphs um, utopian girlhood um, using toy ponies as avatars. Um, and I, all, I love that, I love My Little Pony. Um, it wasn't around when I was a kid, but you can probably see behind me, I have Briar's Animal Creations, those plastic horses that were available when I was a kid and I collected those and kept them. Uh, they're all behind me. Um, 
There's also the 1992 Cormac McCarthy novel, um, which is also a, a, a movie called All the Pretty Horses, mm -hmm. um, which is like a classic American Western. Um, and then there's also the other part of the title is that section of revelations that describes the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So each horse um, in this series is titled um, like as though it was the name of the horse with the chemical name of these common plastics. Um, so they're they're so they're icons of both industrial abundance, environmental devastation, and also um, you know sort of the consumerism that like the manes and tails. Mm -hmm. um, are like, um, you know, really intended to sort of refer to the sort of the brightly colored plastics of consumer culture. Talk about color a little bit in the work. I'm just going to scroll through because I know we're, we're, we're <laughs> short on time, but um, talk about the color because when, when I first met you, you were pulling the colors from all the kids marketing and advertising, all the really bright colors and stuff. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the color thing is actually really quite simple. Um, first, just I respond, like just aesthetically, I respond intensely to color. I'm like, I'm a color slut. I have never met a color I didn't like. I mean, it's your I just, dopamine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it's dopamin dopaminergic for me. Like, I, I love color. Like, even um, going on a bike ride, like it's you know, mid, like midwinter in East Central Illinois and, you know, with corn and soy fields that are fallow, you'd, you'd imagine, like there's no, you'd imagine there's no color out there. There's just gray and brown and tan and slight, and it's just gorgeous to me. Um, and then these bright colors, this is another Angry Patriot series. Um, these were painted right after the 2016 election. It was kind of like, no, we're still here. Um, so I, I just love color. And um, that the world keeps throwing color at us, you know, like Pantone has a color of the year every year. So there's a way in which um, the culture clearly shovels color at us as icon and as reference. You know, there's the color of money, there's the color of logos, which are trying to tell us a, a thing or two. And, um, you know, I think about like BP's logo when they changed it to, um, uh, you know, sort of earth friendly yellows and greens, you know, what they were trying to do there. Um, you think of Burger King's logo or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, because, you know, it's yellow and brown. It's like comfort food colors. And then there's the colors of flags. And um, so in addition to the pleasure in color, there's also the, um, the usefulness of color as icon and metaphor and um, also just the way we are probably evolved um, to respond to color. You know, red, there are cells in our visual cortices that are devoted to responding to red and only red. And that would make sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? Red gets our attention because it's, it's both blood and ripe fruit. Mm -hmm. So it helps us survive, avoid the bloody thing, um, or go scavenge it, uh, eat the fruit when it's ripe, less strychnine in it, right? Um, so all these uses of colors, I would, like think about Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire, fantastic book, which talks about evolutionary biology and, and the evolution of colorful things um, and our attraction to colorful things. So think about like consumer culture, um, and the color of flowers, right? Um, you know, how we're evolved to love color. And I guess that that is expressed very strongly in me. Yeah, and I think um, you had also talked about just the psychology of color used to marketing to children. Yes, That's which was yeah. really- which was, was really powerful for you. I mean, it was- it was, you know, because I noticed it when my kid was of the age where he was the target market because they were they were after his brain big time. Anyone who's got had kids, um, raised kids will know, um, you know, the the stuff that's ever the particularly food <laughs> that's uh, that that kids food is advertised directly to kids in a way that is designed to colonize their brains. You want this, and you're not gonna and you're not gonna let up on your parents until they buy this for you. Right. Um, and it's just bizarre, like, you know, fruit gushers or, um, you know, fruit loops, sugar pops, it's like, 
I mean, there's some bright colors there. <laughs> so this is kind of a subdued painting. Yeah, this is sort of a parody color. of um, uh, Durer's Rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of the misapprehension of nature and sort of the consequences of it. Um, yeah, it's sort of, the, again, sort of the uh, apocalyptic uh, consequences of, of misunderstanding our, our place among other species. Um, and also that Durer image is just so amazing. The amazing image. And then it also brought to mind because the Getty did this fabulous show called the uh, Tale of Clara. And there was a yeah. Clara rhinoceros that traveled in the 1750s or something throughout Europe. And they mapped the whole journey and all these artists did paintings of Clara. And yeah, because, yeah, I mean, that must have been astounding, right? And just like, just an amazing thing to see right. in, in that era. Um, but then from the perspective of Clara, what was it like? <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, again, you know, there's a, to, sometimes my, sometimes the animals in my paintings are stand-ins for human beings and sometimes they are animals. Um, but I don't actually, um, I was telling my students last night, while I do, you know, have a value system that acknowledges that there is something, you know, really important and you know, precious and unique about human life. It doesn't mean that there's not a kinship across species, and um, so that idea of interspecies kinship is also really important to me. That 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 we are evolved of the same stuff as every other species on this planet, and that that matters. It matters to think about it. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't, you know, prioritize humans when we need to. Um, in certain ways, but it also shouldn't mean that we don't think about our kinship with these other species. Um, so those are those are just yeah. some sort of important things to me. And these these kind of show your research process because you you are an avid reader. Yeah, I do. I like to I like to read. Do you study is, literature or? Um, I I actually write I actually write short stories. Um, though I have not you know like done a lot of publishing, although when I get a chance, I may, you know, set about collecting rejection notices for short stories just to see if I can't get them published. Um, that's always good. Like, if you want to publish, you've got to be committed to collecting rejections. Yeah, because um, so, all you need is one acceptance. That's right. So. Um, I did have one published once, but um, I, I, I actually read most of what I read. I read, uh, I read science, history, um, theory. I don't, when I, when I say I read critical theory, I read lots of critical theory, but not because I think it's right. In fact, I recognize that the literature um, in, in, uh, of critical theory is, is largely opinion. So it's really problematic, but it also does talk about, you know, what's in, what the academy is talking about. I, reasons to be very, very critical and suspicious of certain, you know, claims of authority. Um, but I, I read science. Um, I read a lot of politics and history. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing that's great about reading, um, I mean, I also have to assign reading for my students, right? But the thing that's great about reading is it's actually like work that I can do lying down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like on the couch with a pile of dogs and, uh, you know, um, and yeah. a stack of books in your head. And a stack of books, yeah. And I'm working, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, my feet on a pillow, but this is work. Make no mistake. So we did have someone ask about your technique and like, do you get down to like one hair brushes or are you, I mean, because some of the detail and the hair and the the textures of the animals and the feathers. Yeah, it's like, you don't, yeah. Um, I do get very obsessive, sometimes too obsessive. Um, with the work, but yeah, um, the brush actually doesn't have to be one hair. It just has to be the right texture so that you, you can actually paint, you know, um, maybe 50 or 60 individual hairs at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean like, um, yeah. So like uh, for painting fur, if you use a, um, it's just gotta be the right texture. Um, like a mongoose, um, you know, a synthetic mongoose brush, um, or, um, 
Do you have a model yeah. toothbrush to show us? Yeah, well, I actually have a, yeah. It's over okay, here. well, hold on just a sec. Yeah. I'll keep going through some of the images. Keep the dog away from the Mountain Dew. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Because I know we're getting close to the end. Okay, I got two good examples right here. These two brushes, can you see them? Yeah, so you can see the texture on these brushes. This is a bristle brush. Mm -hmm. And this is a very old, I've had this brush for 30 years, this one. It's, a, it's very well loved. It's much like a makeup brush. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the texture of it is such that if the if the if you make the paint the right consistency, what you do is you lay in the shadow color. You can see on, on one of these bunnies, for example, the shadow color is like on this one, for example, the shadow color is like burnt umber and uh, uh, and uh, an ultramarine blue um, and in various values. And you lay in that shadow color and then you wait for it to dry. And then you you go back in with the light color, you know, in this case, like a titanium white and make sure the paint is the right texture and you just pick up just the right amount and then you just sort of lay it on there and you know and that's that's the way you paint hair that's the way you paint wow. hair or fur um it's amazing it's the same with uh, the feathers if the if you've got the right brush and in these case i like to let, use those white nylon flats uh they kind of have to be new but um um they last a long time i've got brushes that i've had for 30 years um, and um, yeah, so, the, so the, it's the texture of the brush um, that will give you the texture mm -hmm. of, the, of the paint and that's the way it works. So somebody also asked where you're based. Well, <laughs> I teach at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So right now I'm in our, um, our home and studio um, that's in a rural area about 20 miles from campus. Um, in, in scenic picturesque East Central Illinois. But I suppose you could call me Chicago based because that's really where my career sort of started and that's that's the closest city. Um, I had a, I've had, but I had a studio in, I had studios, I grew up in the New York area, had a studio, two studios in New York. Um, and then, uh, you know, motherhood sort of kept me quite local, but yeah, so. That's sort of my geography. I love Los Angeles though. Yeah. Well, yeah. you had a pop-up show where I saw you this summer at Cop Copland Del Rio. And then you yes. have your show up in Seattle right now with Copland Del Rio. Yes. Yeah. And how how was that opening? Because you the last time we spoke, you were heading out for it, I think. Oh, it was great. I, I'm so I I love. I mean, I know Elena is 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 here, and um, so she's heard me say this before, but it 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 it's worth saying again. Um, I think they have a fantastic program, and um, like so many amazing artists, and I'm just honored to be part of their program. And um, uh, I always have <laughs> a blast. I can hardly believe that it's a business trip, you know, because it's just really. <laughs> <laughs> really fun uh every time so um yeah um and they, they're just they're just an amazing gallery and always have been uh venerable and you can yep. see why um yeah a real commitment to you and your work and does anybody else have any other questions because i know we're right at one o'clock but i just wanted to see if we could get anything else in before we let Lori go um this is our last image. Uh, do you, I love this creature. <laughs> <laughs> he's in New York. He, he's, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, good. And then, thank you, Lori. This has been wonderful. And I just wanna close um, on this slide because we're next up, we have Thomas Woodruff, who I think is in our audience today. And I know, Lori, you know Tom from years ago when you guys showed together. What was it in Cincinnati? Yeah, Tom, yeah. Tom, we were we. You remember hanging out in 1997 in Cincinnati at the Contemporary Arts Center with that show with Fred Stonehouse and Yoko Ono. Oh, that's a pretty good combination. <laughs> yeah, Yoko was not was was uh, um, in a in a, in a, in an adjacent room. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, then uh, Tom, Fred, and I were in uh, the rest of the space. It was a big, Fabulous. it was a big show. That was wonderful. Hi, yeah. everybody. Yep. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, <laughs> so, yep. well, thank you. Yoko, Yoko phoned in her appearance. Oh, that's yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, doesn't she? <laughs> and, and do you remember the, um, the, there was, a, she put in a pile, she put a pile of rocks in the gallery and said that the audience was to take these rocks and either put, put their best wishes and thoughts onto them or their, their, their worst um, fears and thoughts onto them. And um, somebody put the rocks in front of our works. <laughs> <laughs> so you it don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> square of sorrow or the square of joy. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't so, know whether whether ours were sorrows or joys, but it was all good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, um, we are out of time. I 